uh, because I'm going to put this on the uh, on the uh, Ackland Billy website and on the YouTube channel for people who are not able to attend this evening. So thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, I am Laura Piercy. Uh, uh, several of you know me, especially if your students are based at Ackland Burley. I currently work at Ackland Burley as the Progress and Pathways Leader, uh, so I am responsible for UCAS, HE's, pa HE Pathways and, and also year 11 into 12 enrollment. Uh, as of September, I'm going to be the Associate Director of LASWAP, so you're going to be seeing more of me, uh, regardless of where your, uh, your students are based, your children are based. And one of the things that comes under my remit is exactly this, is uh, UCAS and Pathways uh, and all that kind of uh, business, whatever our, your children are going to do after year 13. So the purpose of this evening is it's got mainly a UCAS focus, and the focus is mainly on the UCAS application itself, uh, what it is, how you fill it in, uh, some things about deadlines. I'm going to show you a UCAS application so you can see what it looks like. Uh, but there is some other, uh, there's some more information at the end about other things as well that are not UCAS or not universities and a little bit about gap years uh, and other things that young people might want to, uh, to go and do in the next couple of years. So I will crack on. Uh, the slides for this will be on the Ackland Burley website. Uh, if if you can't access the, the website, uh, my email address will be at the end of this uh, of this presentation. You can always email me. I can send the slides to you directly if you prefer that. Um, I really recommend that you sign up to this link, which is uh, why it's on the front page here. Uh, and that is, as it suggests, the parents sign up for UCAS. Uh, it means that UCAS will keep you up to date with important deadlines uh, and other bits of information that you will want to know if your young person is applying for UCAS university. So it, first of all, then, uh, some key dates. So the first key date that comes up in terms of UCAS is what we call the early entry deadline, for the very simple reason that it's an earlier entry. Uh, and the courses that fall under this deadline are anything, any degree at Oxford or Cambridge, um, and any medicine, dentistry, or veterinary science degree. And the deadline for that is the 16th of October. So really only about five weeks after we come back at the start of year 13. It's very, very quick turnover. The Next deadline that uh, we want your young people to pay attention to is around half term, which is when we would expect everyone who is making a university application to have their personal statement finished. Uh, we ideally want all of our young people as part of the swap to get these UCAS applications in before Christmas. Now, the actual deadline isn't until January. But we know from experience that the difference between the number of applications that go in in December and then January is huge. They spike in January. So admissions tutors, admissions departments are run off their feet. That means that if young people can get their applications in before Christmas, they've got a much higher chance of having that application looked at and turned around quickly uh, and not having to wait quite as long. Oh, before I go any further, by the way, what I should have said at the beginning uh, is if you have any questions during this, any general questions, please do add them to the chat and I'll answer them at the end. If you have any questions that are really specific to your child, then it might be better to drop me uh, an email, uh, but it is it is up to you. So they are the basic deadlines. Please put them on your fridge or wherever else you put your uh, your key dates. What is UCAS then? Really simply, because uh, if you... If you've, if you've been to uni uh, in the UK, you have probably used UCAS, but if you went quite a long time ago, like I did, uh, then UCAS was very different then. It was a, it was a piece of paper uh, that, you, that you had to write on. It is now, of course, not that. It is all online. Uh, and if you didn't go to, the univer to university in the UK, then you, won't have you may have not come across UCAS before. Uh, it stands for University and Colleges Admission Service. It is a centralised service that's used to apply to uni. So if you're applying for an undergraduate degree and and some postgraduate degrees, then you apply through UCAS in over 95% of cases. They run university applications. So instead of having to send an application off to five different universities, you do one application through UCAS through a centralized service and UCAS send it to the universities for you. 
Uh, UCAS has two, another function. So that's the apply function uh, that you apply under. And then following that, it has something called the track function. And what the track function does is manage the applications that you've sent off. So when you send them off to uni, when you get your replies from uni, either offers or invitations to interview or requests for a portfolio or whatever, that all comes through track. We can also track this at school, which is really handy because it means that anyone who is based with us, so, so the, the teachers at your child's base school can see uh, which universities your child has applied for, which university they've, they've got offers for. Uh, and we also press that final button that sends that student information off to UCAS. So it means we can check it first. Uh, UCAS does have a cost. It's £27.50 to apply for up to five courses. You don't have to use all five. Uh, we encourage you to because you may as well, because it costs £27.50 regardless. Uh, the application process then. So the first thing you have to do is set up an account with UCAS. This is called a UCAS Hub account. Most of our students at LaSwap actually set this up all the way back in March because when we went to uh, the Excel, UCAS uh, Excel, UCAS uh, Discovery over at the Excel, you had to have a hub account to book onto it. So lots of students did then. So you go back into that account. Each school then has something called a buzzword. And that buzzword connects your child's application to their school. If they don't use that, the school can't see their application and they can't add their reference. So it's really important that they get their buzzword and they uh, and they make sure that they add it in. Ours at Ackland Burley is Burley 2024. Uh, I imagine the other slot schools will have something just as straightforward. The first thing you do then is enter all the general like admin info. There's loads of help from school about this. You then enter your qualifications. So the qualifications the students have already done, their GCSEs, and what they are doing now. You choose up to five courses or five universities. Now, for most universities and courses, that can be five courses at five separate universities. It could be five courses at the same university or a mixture of both. Uh, the Exceptions to that are Oxford and Cambridge. You can only apply for one course at either Oxford or Cambridge and medicine, dentistry and veterinary, where you can only apply for four courses in those areas. And the fifth one has to be something else. The final bit of work that students do on their application is their personal statement, which I'll talk about a bit more later. You pay a uh, debit card, you pay your £27.50 and the school is then notified that that student has finished their application. We then enter their predicted grades and we enter their academic reference and then that application is sent off to UCAS. So that's the uh, that's the kind of journey through UCAS. Um, I so most students now should be around this kind of area around the general admin info, entering the qualifications and they are re probably researching the courses and universities they want to apply to. So what do we do then? Your child's tutor will oversee this UCAS application, mainly in personal development time, but also in tutor time. Uh, your tutor can advise on university choices or course choices. They will be a key person in reviewing the personal statement, and they also compile the academic reference for everyone in their tutor group. The subject teachers, each subject teacher writes a subject specific academic reference for each child that they teach, uh, and that is then compiled together. Uh, the subject teachers also provide the predicted grades that go to UCAS, and they can support with into if your child needs an interview or a pre assessment or they're doing something like art and they need to put a portfolio together, they can also support with those things. There's then the head of year or the director of learning or the student progress and pathways leader, if your school has one. And our job is to advise on the university choices. It's to review the overall application. It's to review the personal statements and sort of check over the references. And we are the people who send off that, ultimately send off that application to UCAS. So as you can see, there are several, there are lots of staff involved in this and like several layers of people who are supporting and advising and checking things for our young people. So. I'm going to, we're going to have a quick look then at the UCAS application, a very quick look at each section, see what it looks like. 
Uh, we're going to start with the profile section, which is the basically the admin. This is super easy. Now, most of it is super straightforward, name, contact details, and so on. Uh, but please ask if you are unsure about anything. The things that people tend to be the most unsure about are either nationality or residency details. Uh, this is important if your child has a dual nationality or they have a right to remain. They are an EU student, an EU uh, citizen with right to remain, or they are not a British citizen. Then. Uh, uh, these things these things become a bit more important and the finance section now for the vast vast majority of people of young people they will choose this option uh which is them saying they want to take a student loan uh the only situation in which people should tick something else is if you are privately funding their degree or if they are not eligible for a student loan. Very, very few people are not eligible for student loan. It is only the people generally who are not British citizens who are not eligible, but your school will be able to help you with that on a one to one basis. Um, I have got as well a PDF, like step by step guide to filling in these sections of UCAS that has like screenshots in it and really does go click this, click this, click this. Uh, if you if your child has not seen this, not had access to it and they want it, then again, please feel free to drop me an email and I can send you a copy over. So I'm just going to uh, stop sharing for a second and come back in uh, because I'm going to show you. UCAS. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can see here uh, that this is my test account. So it's called test. Uh, and that this is a, a hub account applying for an undergraduate course in 2024. So this is what your child will see when they log in. It will have their name up in the corner up here. Uh, and there's loads of stuff in UCAS that can really help them. Uh, there's key dates, uh, there's advice on personal statements and all kinds of other information, including this facility to uh, sort of remotely chat with students at a uni or a college that they're interested in going to. That can be really helpful. Um, but if we click on your application, go to the application here. then you can see the application in process. So you can see here that my application is linked to Ackland Burley School uh, because I've put that buzzword in. You can see here that I've started adding in exemplar choices, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. And at the bottom here, you can see what I was just talking about there, which are the kind of admin stuff. So personal details like your name and your gender, Go back. Uh, your contact details, how UCAS can get hold of you, and how the uh, and how the universities can get hold of you, and where you live. Uh, nationality details, as I was just talking about. Uh, supporting information most students don't need. English language skills, again, only you. You most students will tick you uh, that you don't need English language proficiency skills uh, because you're educated in the UK finance and funding and then at the bottom here where you put in your education and again you can see where I've started filling in some exemplar uh, bits and bobs here So in that qualification section that we just looked at, students will need to enter all of their qualifications that they've already got. So all their GCSEs, all of their BTECs, anything that they've already got, which school they achieved them at, when they got them, the grade. And this is really important. They have to put the exam board in. That means that in most cases, they will need to track down their GCSE certificates. Um, we will not necessarily have that information. If the student did not do their GCSEs at the school that they're currently at, so if they're based at LSU, for example, if they didn't do their GCSEs at LSU, we won't have that information. So the student will need to find that themselves, either on their certificates or from their old school. Um, if they've done a qualification more than once, like a GCSE reset, they put in the most recent grade, their best grade, and then they also put in any qualifications that they are currently working towards. So A-levels, B-techs, C-techs, GCSE resets, like everything that they are currently doing. 
they do not put in their own predicted grades. Tutors have to put in uh, their predicted grades that are provided by the teachers. Um, and as you might have seen on that example there, I'll just show you again in a sec, each LASWAP school, unfortunately, has to be entered separately. Uh, LASWAP can't be entered as, as like one entity. So if your child does a qualification in in so that you know, they're based at LSU, but they do an A-level at Burley, they have to put in LSU and Ackland Burley, and they have to put the right qualifications under the right school. Uh, I'll just show you that a little bit again. So here you can see in my example, I've got Ackland Burley full time for A-level history, and then I've added the Santa Union part time, and then I could put in uh a level whatever i want to so that's all like practical stuff um and again schools will go through that and we can provide loads of help with that if students get stuck if they don't know what to put they will generally just need to ask their tutor who'll be able to help them out the harder thing the trickier thing is around choosing the right courses and making sure that they are completing an application that really works for them um once that application goes to ucas so once we press that button the send button and off it goes uh, up to UCAS, it is hard and it is sometimes impossible to amend the the choices that they've made. Uh, so they need to get it right. Uh, that's why the student themselves doesn't send the application to UCAS. They send when they press submit, it comes to us at the school. We give it a little check over and we send it off. Uh, however, when the student sends it to us, they should be happy for it to go. They are saying that you know, these are the choices that they have made. Uh, we do look over the applications and we look over them for like often big mistakes, glaring mistakes. Uh, but we uh, cannot check, for example, that every course they've chosen fits exactly with their predicted grades, uh, you know, for example. So we need students to be doing that work for themselves as well. Uh, and again, using their tutors on that week by week basis to support them in personal development. So when they're choosing courses, uh, they should look really closely at the type of university they want to go to. Do they want to sit at, stay on a campus? Do they want to live in a city? The location is really important because, uh, you know, the University of Aberdeen might look great until you look at where it is on the map and you realize that it's, you know, an eight hour train ride away and it's going to cost hundreds of pounds every time you want to come home. Uh, the main thing to look at, the most important thing, is the course itself. So how it's assessed, what the modules are made up of. Um, a course like history, for obvious re reasons, will be very different at one university to the next because it's never going to cover all of history. So they need to check the modules and see, you know, am I interested? What kind? Which? What am I interested in? And does this university actually cover it? Uh, graduate destinations can also be worth looking at, like what do people do uh, once they've finished at that university? Uh, the final one is league table rankings. Um, they are worth a look, uh, but they they all use different criteria. There are three main ones. They use different criteria. Uh, the Guardian one, for example, doesn't take research into account. The, the other ones do. Uh, so you know, have a look at them. But be aware that they are not the be-all and end-all. And also, if you're looking at league tables, check subject rankings, because the league tables give you the league table of that university overall. But there might be a huge difference between, you know, the computer science department and the drama department at a university. You could be top in the country for one and, you know, 90th in the country for the other. So do check individual subject rankings as well as uh, league table rankings. Um, a really good uh, platform that we use that helps uh, students uh, make course choice decisions is something called Unifrog, which I'll just show you now. Now, most uh, LASWAP students have access to Unifrog uh, and they are able to, uh, you to, to access it. Uh, let me just find it. Nope, that's for later. <laughs> Oops. 
Sorry about that. Sorry, I can't get to it at the moment. I will show you Unifrog in a second uh, when uh, when I can actually uh, move the the bar at the top of the screen and get to it. There we go. So, Unifrog is uh, an online uh, platform. It has all these little bits in it, like quizzes and stuff. But the main useful things in Unifrog are in these sections here, which are different libraries where students can look at different subjects and find out all about that subject at university. There's little videos, there's exemplar statements, uh, there's stuff about how to get in and what grades you might need and whatnot. And then there's these really good tools at the bottom which are shortlists. Uh, and there's one of these for UK universities. There's one for apprenticeships, which works in exactly the same way. And there's also ones for universities abroad and for Oxbridge. And students can go through these. They can put in the grades that they are likely to get. And they can make shortlists based on different things, like how far away it is, uh, you know, what kind of university it is. Um, you can tick no courses out of my range, so it will only show you courses that match up to your predicted grades. Uh, so that is a really good platform. Um, ask if your child doesn't have access to it or you've not seen them use it, then ask them, get them to uh, uh, ask their uh, tutors. Uh, if they don't have access to it, then UCAS, under UCAS Search, have a very, very similar platform, to be honest, um, where you can do a similar kind of, of filtering and make short lists and look at courses. So the best way to pick a course is to go to the university and have a look around. And if you can't make it to every single university they're interested in, just try to go as, to as many as possible. Uh, living in London can be really helpful for this because there are just loads of universities that are really close by. So even if they're not, you know, super keen on Greenwich or South Bank or Goldsmiths or, you know, UCL or Kings or whatever, maybe go to the open day anyway and have, just have a look at some different kinds of universities, especially if it's close by. Um, there are also uh, online tours that they can do. Um, there are workshops and tasters online they can uh, sign up for. Um, and to, again, give them a sense of what the university and the course is like. Um, narrow them down, make shortlists, and then they need to start to look at the entry requirements and be really honest. So some courses, uh, you know, things like your Oxbridge courses, it won't surprise you. Courses at really competitive universities have really high entry requirements and they are not flexible. So <laughs> if you're not going to get like three A star grades, then don't apply for medicine at Cambridge because you're just not going to get in. Like you're wasting a course choice. Look at something that is more realistic. As I said, do they really want to live 350 miles away from home? Have they actually read the course content? Do they know what they're going to be studying for three years? Do they know how the course is assessed? Do, is it mainly coursework? Is it mainly exams? Does it work to their strengths? Or you know, do they know? Um, and does it link to what they want to do in the future? If they don't know what they want to do in the future, which is completely understandable, then they might want to look for something that keeps their options open. So something that doesn't narrow them down too much. Either of those is a, is, is a good way of going about it. Finally, of course, do they enjoy it? They are going to spend three years and a lot of money um, studying this. If they are already at the point, if, you know, if they're studying English literature now and they're already complaining that they hate reading for English Lit, then they should not be applying for a, you know, a course in English Lit. It is not going to be something that will work out well. So how do they work out the entry requirements then compared to what they're getting now? How do they look at what the unis are asking for and work it out? So each grade that you can get at BTEC, BTEC and CTEC are the same, A-level 
at A level is worth a fixed number of UCAS points. So an A star grade in any subject at A level gets you 56 points. An E grade in any subject at A level gets you 16 points. A distinction star, distinction star in any BTEC subject gets you 112. You, you get the idea. A, a pass pass gets you 32. So unis sometimes say we want AAA, and they sometimes say they want you know, the points instead like and they, sometimes they list both so they might say we want three b's or we want 120 points um you can get ucas points from things that aren't your a levels and your b tech so for example uh high level music grades uh, from grade five grade five upwards uh they have ucas points attached to them but generally you although although still put them down because it shows that you've got you know a lot of skill in that area but generally unis are not interested in your grades from there uh as a contributor towards your uh your degree, they will usually say that the point should come from a combination of A-levels, B-techs, hires, blah, blah, uh, because they're saying they don't want points to come from other places. So realistically, you're looking at the points that you get from your A-levels, your B-tech, or a combination of both. Uh, there is a tariff calculator as well, where you can, like, like I've done here, you put the grades in, so you put in, I'm going to get B, 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 and it will tell you what grades. You can put in, I'm going to get merit, merit, B, and it will tell you what that is in points. So you can convert it if you need to. So once they have sort of worked out where they want to go, what kind of university they want to go to, what kind of course they want to study, then they need to narrow it down and they need to choose their five. We recommend that they do it this way. We recommend that they choose two aspirational courses, two safe, secure courses, and a backup course. Uh, they can pick more than one course at the same uni if they really like it. So they could apply for English and English and history combined at the same university if they wanted to, something like that. They should not choose five courses that need three A star grades, and they shouldn't choose five courses that need, you know, three D grades either. It should be a a, a, a mixture around about this five courses. Uh, and if the entry criteria, as I've said, if it's listed as points rather than grades, use the tariff calculator to make sure that they they are working it out properly. So, for example, for a student who's predicted three Bs, what they might pick, their courses might look like this. So they might pick two courses that are kind of ABB-ish, maybe an AAB, if, you know, if they're feeling confident. They should pick two courses that are on their predicted grades and one course that is slightly below. Same that we've got a student here, a BTEC and A-level student, predicted 112 UCAS points, then the same sort of thing. They should go for two around 120, 128, two around what they're predicted and one that is lower uh, because that means they should get a range of offers uh, from a range of universities. Um, personal statement is the bit that comes, is the next thing, the bit that comes after that. So we've put in all our information, we've put in our education, we've put in our, our choices, we know where we want to go, we now need to convince them to give us a place. So this is the student's opportunity to prove to their uni that they are the best student for that course. Um, and this statement is an academic document. So the vast majority of it, like at least 85% of it, should cover academic stuff. It should talk about the skills in the subject they want to do. It should evidence those skills. It should give evidence of extra work they've done outside of school that supports this so we call this super curricular learning this is particularly important if they are if they are applying for a competitive course so a course at one of the you know, at a university that's classed as a russell group university or a course at a university that has high entry grades they will be expecting that student to evidence extra work they've done not just the work they've done in the classroom um, it should also prove that they're literate <laughs> and that they can communicate well. You know, it should be a well-written document. Um, they can include like extracurricular stuff. They can include work experience and things if they want to. But that should be a very minor amount of the statement. And it has to be relevant to the course they are applying for. You know, this university don't want to know about their 100 uh, percent. You know, uh, attendance certificate from primary school that's not relevant it, you know, they might be an amazing they might they might play football on the weekend but if they're applying for a degree in astrophysics they 
it might not you know, there are probably other things that they want to talk about that are more going to be more important to the uni than football um this can be quite tricky if you've got young people who do loads of extracurricular stuff it can feel quite bad to have to leave it out but they do need to think about this as an academic document and an academic essay it's uh about a well it's 4000 characters so that is about a page in size 12 a sensible size 12 font about 500 words um so that is what they are writing you know a one side essay a cover letter about why they want to go and study uh maths for 3 years so they need to be really specific about their achievements and they need to, as I said, refer to stuff that they've used to learn more. Loads of super curricula, you can't over egg it here. Relevant work experience, volunteering and things should go in uh, and they should make sure that it's proofread. Uh, what we you know, And it should be, of course, academic and professional. It's a professional academic document. Um, Please don't lie. Um, we can tell pretty quickly if they ha if this statement has not been written by them or it's full of rubbish. You can have a plagiarism checker as well that actually just flags chunks of text if it's been plagiarized. Um, we don't want them to list irrelevant stuff. As I said, even if they're proud of it, this can be quite tricky. Um, but if it's not relevant to the course they're applying for, the university don't need to know. Um, I've already used that example. We don't want them to swallow a thesaurus. Uh, we get this every year where, where young people write and then they just throw it through um, an, an online thesaurus, basically. And it ends up either making no sense or just sounding really weird. It needs to be academic and professional, but it should sound like you. Like It should sound like the student writing, uh, because otherwise the university aren't getting a sense of you. And so it's, you know, it's not a good statement. Avoid things like pretentious quotations, avoid cliches, just write, you know, honestly about your own, you know, why you want to do that subject, the other work that you've done in that subject, what you've done in your A-levels or BTEC that you're really proud of, that will fill it, that will fill the, uh, the word count. There is loads of support around personal statements that will be done mainly through personal development. So please do ask uh, you make sure that they come to personal development uh, sessions because that is when they will get feedback and support from their tutor. Uh, students usually just write their statements in Word, give them to their, you know, their tutor will then check them and then they'll copy and paste them into the UCAS application at the end once they are ready and happy with it. Uh, I know we haven't started personal statements yet at Burley. Uh, some schools may have done. Uh, we'll be starting in September. But I would really encourage, and I have encouraged certainly students that are applying to competitive unis to start planning their statements over the summer. So start compiling super curricular stuff. Start, if they've got gaps in their knowledge, start filling them in. Start making like notes and lists of things that they've done that are going to go in their statement. Uh, that would be a really good use of a bit of time over the next couple of months. If they are applying for early entry, uh, they'll have already spoken to me or someone at their school about it. And those statements obviously need to be done much quicker uh, because those applications have to be sent off months before uh, in October. Um, references. Every student gets a, a reference. Uh, we provide a reference to UCAS. This is a subject specific reference written by teachers. Uh, as part of that reference, we also include some general information about the school. So we include some general information about the swap, the fact it's a consortium, a little bit about how the swap works. And we also include some information about the school itself, mainly that it's a state school, about how many students we have on roll, that kind of information. If there are any extenuating circumstances regarding the student, that also goes in a separate section for the reference. So that might be things like uh, disabilities. It might be things like special educational needs. It might be things like uh, disruption to education caused by outside influences. Uh, anything like that will go in the extenuated circumstances section. Uh, and we ask students as well about their extenuating circumstances. We've asked them to fill in some information for their tutor and to check in with their tutors. We do encourage them to to share extenuating circumstances because it can help them to get what's called a contextual offer from a university where if there has been disruption to their education for some reason, the university will offer a slightly lower offer. So maybe, you know, AAB instead of AAA, and that can make all the difference with the student getting in. Um, 
The reference also includes the predicted grades, and these are decided on by the teachers. And the predicted grades are holistic. They are based on, they're not just HSE grades, they're based on, they, they are included, but they're also based on work all the way through year 12 and the capacity that that student has to improve in year 13. Um, we always set predicted grades to give our students the best possible chance. We are not in the business of trying to cut off anyone's opportunities with predicted grades. But we will also not lie. We won't fabricate them. We won't completely pull them out of thin air. The other thing we won't do is the sixth form team. So the head of year, uh, people like myself, the directors and whatnot, we will not change predicted grades that subject teachers have set because they are the experts. Uh, I know absolutely nothing about A-level maths. Um, there is no way I could change an A-level maths predicted grade for a student, no matter what they say to me. Uh, it is the professional opinion of the teacher that stands. Um, those predicted grades you know, are, are, are given over to us by by the teachers, they're given to the tutor, and as I say, it's all compiled into a reference, and they can be revisited up to the point that the UCAS uh, reference is sent, the UCAS application with the reference is sent off. So then, it's gone. The application is gone. It's done. Uh, the student can sit back and have five minutes and actually have a little rest. Now, universities make different kinds of offers uh, and it takes them different amounts of time to make those offers as well. Some unis are really on it and are really fast at making offers. Some of them are useless and they take forever. Some of them have a reputation for taking a really long time. Edinburgh, Kings, <laughs> just every year just take take a long time to make their decisions. And that's not a reflection on the students at all. It is just the way that they do their admissions. So they choose their students in a few ways then. Uh, they always look at the predicted grades, always, always. They, may, they will look at the personal statement. They will look at the reference. They will sometimes, in the case of Oxbridge, in the case of medicine, in the case of some law degrees, some maths degrees, do ask students to do a pre-assessment. And in some cases, they will do an interview. Again, the only places that tend to do interviews are Oxbridge, medicine, dentistry, veterinary, seeing a pattern here, and then some other vocational degrees. So a lot of allied health degrees, things like radiography, nursing, uh, do interviews, education tends to do interviews, and uh, subjects like music will do an audition. Uh, art courses will often invite students in to talk about their portfolios as well. Um, if you are sitting a medicine adjacent course, you need to sit a UCAT or a BMAT. Again, some students do applying for a law degree will need to sit a, a, an LNAT. Some students applying for a maths degree or computer science degree will need to sit a MAT. It will tell them on the entry requirements page on the when they're looking for their university. If they have any questions about pre-assessments, please ask them to talk to their form tutor really quickly because some of them, like the UCAT, needs to be booked now. Uh, most of them need to be booked in September. So again, there's there's not a lot of there's not a lot of time when we get back in year 13. Those decisions have to be made now if they're applying for those courses. Uh, as I said, not that many places interview most students will not have an interview um, and they, they really won't. Uh, it's only for those selected courses that they will. And if they do have an interview, it will probably be a panel interview. Lots of them are online now. Oxford are all online this year, for example. Um, if they do get an interview, we will support them. We will provide mock interviews for, stu for any student who has a uh, an interview. Um, for university. Uh, those interviews are not these things. They're not trying to catch them out. They're not going to ask them stupid questions like why is a strawberry the best fruit or whatever. Uh, they're not memory tests. It is an academic conversation where the university are trying to work out how well that student would fit on their course. Uh, they're meant to be hard. Like you shouldn't come out of an interview thinking you thinking that was easy because you're you're talking to a professor, an academic at one of the best universities in the country, like probably a world ranking expert in the thing that you're talking about. It's going to be hard. Um, and they're designed to make them think, but they are also designed to see if they actually want to go to that university, because if they hate that interview process, it may be that that uni is not right for them. Like all interviews, it's a two way process. And as I've said, we will prep any students who have an academic, an academic interview uh, when we, you know, in 
September, usually around October, November time. Interviews start around November of year 13. A quick word on early entry then. Um, if your child is applying for early entry, so again, just to reiterate, Oxford, Cambridge, medicine, dentistry, veterinary, then the school that your child is based at should already know about this and be supporting them. Uh, if they are deciding now, I'm sorry, there's a typo in there. If they're deciding now that they want to apply for one of these courses, it may be too late because they need to have spent a much more time doing prep. Um, so it's, you know, if they haven't yet decided they want to do early entry, uh, they, you know, they really need to speak to someone really, really urgently if you think that they might fall under that. Uh, some of the courses as well, especially veterinary, medicine, dentistry as well, need things like a lot of work experience. Again, it might just be that it's a bit too late for them to get the work experience that they need to apply. So you know, speak to tutors, speak to heads of you. So just to round off the, the full UCAS experience, then the application's gone in, the universities have read it, the universities have looked over and they have made their offers. So if you get your application in before the 31st of January, the university have to consider it. They have to look at it. If it comes in after that, UCAS doesn't really close, but if it comes in after that, then they don't need to look at it at all. And if it's a popular course, they will just bin it off. So we tell all of our students they have to meet this deadline or you know, they, they really the, the deadline is not negotiable. Um, most offers are then made before the end of March. So the unis have like a couple of months to make those offers. Again, the earlier they apply, they might find that the earlier the, the offers come back. Uh, they then have to respond to those offers by June. They will generally either get a conditional offer, which is about 95% of offers. Uh, this is where they say, if you get three Bs or if you get 120 points, then you've got a place on this course. Occasionally, universities offer an unconditional offer. So regardless of what grade you get, uh, you you can come here, but they are much less common now than they used to be a couple of years ago. Students then pick a firm choice and an insurance choice from those then. So they can get up to five offers. They pick two. The firm one is where they really want to go and the insurance is back up. So it should have a lower grade or point offer and they can't switch around between those two. So they have to be certain that they are picking them in the right in the right order. And as I've said here, don't go with an unconditional just because it's unconditional. Don't choose the easy option. You know, go for the one that they really want. If they don't get any offers or they decide, actually, I don't want to do radiography anymore. I want to do philosophy or whatever. Then they can uh, decline them all. Or if they don't get any offers, they can use something called the UCAS Extra Service where they get to make another choice and they don't have to pay any more. They can just make another choice and that, that opens in February. And if in August, when they get their uh, results, if they don't meet the conditions for either their firm or their insurance, or again, if they just change their mind about what they want to do, they can use clearing. Uh, clearing is just a list of all the courses in the UK that aren't full. 92% of universities have uh, courses available in clearing. Uh, so it's pretty much everyone. Um, and you can also trade up as well. So if you've applied for a course, say, that was three Cs, but you've actually got three Bs, you might have a look in clearing and decide you want to go somewhere that has higher requirements. I'm not going to talk a lot now about paying for university because it's a whole webinar on its own, <laughs> which, I'm, which I will do next year. Uh, but try not to be too worried, is all I would say, about tuition fees and loans. Uh, there's not very little to pay in advance if anything and then the loan amounts are taken out of postgraduate wages via PAYE uh, so if if they certainly if they earn 30 grand a year or less you actually pay very little uh, sort of 50 about 15 pounds a month back off your off your student loan um, student loans cover there are two different types of student loans there's one that covers your your fees that goes straight from uh, the student finance company to the university, you never see it. And the second loan is to cover your maintenance costs. So that's to pay things like your rent. And that goes into this is paid into the student's bank account. You have to apply for that in uh, by the deadlines, the end of May. So if, you, if they're applying for university in 2024, they'll need to apply for student finance by the end of May 2024. But I do a whole webinar on this next year. So we'll talk about it more then. These are the main ways that you can 
help at this stage really it's really just have these conversations and talk to them and encourage them and really get them to dig into why they want to go and what they want to do try and attend open days with them or make or make them go encourage them to go to open days and please encourage them to use the expertise we have in school we've got brilliant tutors and teachers who've been doing this for absolutely years uh, there's a load of useful websites in here that you can have a look through at your leisure on these slides. Uh, but I'm just going to do five minutes or so on what some of the alternatives are if they don't want to go to university, because they don't have to. You know, it's not university or nothing. There are there are other options. Um, we have sent several students in the last few years off to do either foundation, like an art foundation course. A lot of our students who do art BTEC go on to do art foundation. It's free. Uh, for students who are under 19. It gives them another year of specialism in that area. Or again, we've had some students who want, might want to specialise in a particular area. So we had a student, for example, who did uh, BTEC Applied Science, and then instead of going straight to uni, they went to Capel Manor to do uh, veterinary science, and then they went to do veterinary nursing at uni after that. So they took like an extra year to do another level three course. So that is a good option for a lot of students. Um, there are also, and you'll have heard, apps, I imagine, absolutely loads about apprenticeships in the last couple of years. Apprenticeships have really changed. It isn't like carrying a spirit level around for, for a boss anymore. It is a proper job that in most cases pays really quite well. Um, the main sectors that have really good apprenticeships are things like law, accountancy, uh, marketing, business management, um, but there are also more traditional sectors like construction, plumbing, hair and beauty, things like that. There aren't very many apprenticeships in things like the arts. Um, it, it does tend to be a more business focused thing, but they do pop up occasionally. So it is worth it is worth looking at. Um, the government website for it, you know, the government collect apprenticeships all in one place on the uh, apprenticeship website, uh, which you can use to filter and look at um, distance from school, distance from home, different types of apprenticeships, different levels of apprenticeships. Uh, as, as I've said here, there are higher and advanced and then degree level apprenticeships. The difference with a degree level apprenticeship, as the name suggests, is you get a degree as part of the apprenticeship, which is really appealing to a lot of young people because then you don't pay any tuition fees and you're earning a wage. So the degree level ones that normally take five years because they combine full time work and study, they pay for your degree. Uh, level three and four ones are usually much shorter, 12 to 18 months. So if you're not quite so certain what sector you want to go into, a level three or four apprenticeship is a good call. Um, they are often paid quite well. Um, if you do a level three or four apprenticeship, then decide you want to go to university, you can, because you've still not got a degree level qualification. So you absolutely can. And there are some sectors that really are promoting apprenticeship learning. Uh, it is worth noting, though, that some apprenticeships, and in fact, the most famous ones, the most well-known ones, are brutally competitive, more competitive than Oxbridge, for example. Uh, so it is really, th there's a lot of research to be done if your child is interested in an apprenticeship. Although the government do collate apprenticeships together, there is no UCAS for apprenticeships. You, you have to apply to each place completely separately. Uh, and applications can, it's more, it's a job interview, basically. So anything you can be asked to do in a job interview, you can be asked to do an apprenticeship application, including, you know, phone interviews, group interviews, task days and whatever. Um, and so applying for them can be difficult, but they are really, there are really good opportunities out there. Again, we can help you. We can help young people with it. But if you're applying for an apprenticeship, you have to be very self-starting and really good at like seeking things out for yourself. Lots of our students take gap years, especially post-COVID, you know, two years of not being able to go anywhere. Suddenly you can go places. It's great. Uh, so if they want to go, but they don't want to go right now, they can defer. So they can put their application in, but instead of putting it in for 2024, they can put it in for 2025 and just do the rest of the UCAS process as normal. They will then accept those offers, but to start 2025 instead of 2024. 
if during their gap year they decide that they don't want to do that anymore, they can just tell the uni they don't want to take up their place. They're, it's not a contract. And then they can either go and do something else or they can reapply through UCAS for something else. Uh, but deferrals like this aren't available for everything. Like you can't defer for Oxford, Cambridge. You can't defer for medicine. You can't defer for a lot of law degrees. So again, check before you they rely on deferring. Uh, if they still want to take a gap year, but they want to apply for Oxford, for example, they can just they can do their application during the gap year. So the UCAS application while, while they're on their gap year. Um, as I said, there are some courses will let them apply now for 2024, then defer later in the year, but they don't have to. So you are risking it a little bit there. And of course, the other option. Uh, is is to just go straight into work. And again, we have students who do. They uh, you know, they get part-time work during their A-levels or their BTEC, and they then decide that that is what they want to continue doing, or they have family links that mean that they, they want to just go and get a job. Um, and although that's not the easiest route, it is a valid one. So a few useful websites at the end there, mainly about apprenticeships. And for people who were asking about my email address, uh, my... Uh, I, my name is Laura Piercy. I've just changed. I've just changed my name. Uh, so my email address is still my old name, which is lstanley at acklenburley.camden.sch.uk. So I don't I don't mind if you use my old name or my new name, uh, but my email address is lstanley. I'm going to just leave that up there and have a quick look in the Q&A and see if we've got any questions that need answering for the last five minutes or so. Uh, all right, so uh, I will apply for, so uh, post the link up again for UCAS parent sign up. I'll go back to it uh, when I finished here so people can copy that down. First question, are there any negatives to applying earlier if you're not applying for Oxford or Cambridge? No, if as long as you know where you want to go. Uh, so if uh, that student has already decided early on that they uh, that they want to where they want to go and what courses they want to do there are no negatives at all in fact it can be a positive because they are likely to get an earlier response from the uni an earlier offer because they are really going to be quiet around november if it's not oxford and cambridge or medicine then the admissions departments aren't doing a lot so no there there are no real negatives um the only thing is if they want a bit more time i suppose to to make the decision uh, I've already given my email address. In terms of the slides here, they will be on the Ackland Burley website and they will be on the Ackland Burley YouTube channel, 6 form YouTube channel. If you would like me to email you the slides or the link to the uh, recording, just email me and I will and I will send them over to you. Uh, is there supporting information on the UCAS form for students with additional needs? Yes, there is. That comes under that extenuating circumstances uh, section. The school will fill in the information they have on any uh, special educational needs for any student that we have uh, at, our, at our schools. Uh, Oh, this is a, a specific question about the UCAS form itself. How does a student know whether to put full time or part time in the school category? So that is if uh, students are uh, studying at more than one swap school. You put your base school down as full time and any other schools down as part time, please. Again, students will be told that in personal development. Uh, is anyone at school able to help students with preparation for UCAT and BMAT? We don't have staff who are specialists in UCAT and BMAT exams because we don't have staff who are uh, who are medically trained. Um, there is absolutely loads of preparation online for UCAT and BMAT. Uh, I ran I've run a uh, aspirational medics group for students all across the swap. Um, I did a webinar uh, about a month ago with lots and lots of information there and lots of links to free preparation material for students who are doing UCAT and BMAT exams. Uh, if they speak to their science teachers, there may be some science teachers who who would be able to help, but I can't guarantee guarantee that because as I say our teachers are not um are not trained in medicine and the UCAT and BMAT exams are very specific. Uh, not all students have been given a Unifrog login yet. Ask your tutor, ask the tutor uh, is is all I can say for that one because I don't know what the school schedules are for rolling out Unifrog. Um, 
So at Oxbridge, if you're predicted three A stars, but are shy and potentially not going to do so well at the interview at Oxbridge, is it still worthwhile applying? I Well, it's entirely up to the student. I would say yes, because I think going through the application process is really good. Also, the interview isn't the only important thing. They look at the predicted grades, the personal statement, the interview, and any pre-assessments. And they look at all of those things when they make a decision about whether they accept a student. So it might be someone who isn't the most confident in an interview, but does amazingly in their pre-assessment. So my opinion is yes, but I do also appreciate that it is quite intimidating and a difficult thing to do. So I would never... I would never push a student to apply for Oxbridge if they really didn't want to, but I would encourage them to do so if they if they had any desire to, and they were getting certainly three A stars. Good question. How many words is the personal statement? Uh, it is about 500 words. It's 4,000 characters um, is, is how they measure it. So it's about a page of size 12 A4 font. Uh, the deadlines are, I think I've already said, the 16th of October for early entry, 31st of January for all other courses. Uh, I have talk, spoken about deferment, which is a question there. Uh, is there a quick, easy way to remind about deadlines? The best way to do that is to sign up to the UCAS Parent Hub uh, with the uh, the uh, link that I gave at the beginning of the presentation, because they will email uh, and they have reminders about important deadlines. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, are they still support? Are students still supported by careers guidance at the swap during their gap year? It will depend what they need. We will still provide a UCAS reference. For example, so if a student goes off to do uh, a year out and they decide to apply for UCAS during that time, we will still support them with that UCAS application. Uh, they would still be welcome to contact the school uh, regarding uh, you know, support during that time. Uh, but I think it would depend on the like the extent as to uh, to the careers guidance as to as to what they would need. Uh, but we definitely still support uh, UCAS applications for students who have left the swap. Uh, predicted grades, when are predicted grades given out? So predicted grades are done by uh, subject teachers. They're, they're doing them now. Um, and predicted grades are submitted over summer. So students should be able to be given their predicted grades from the start of year 13. But again, it may vary slightly school by school as to when that information is given to students. So please do ask form tutors. EPQs. So an EPQ counts as an AS level plus. So if your child is doing an EPQ, it's worth slightly more points than an AS level. So I think an A star at EPQ, I think is worth 28 points, uh, whereas it's worth 22 at AS. It's, it's more than an AS level, but it's not as much as a full A level. Um, Lots of universities love EPQs because the skills are exactly what they're looking for. It's an entirely self-driven, uh, self-planned uh, uh, dissertation, basically. Um, I would absolutely, if, if a student is doing an EPQ, it, it must go on their UCAS application. Uh, it can be really beneficial. It can lead to contextual uh, offers, so lower offers. And in direct answer to this question, Oxbridge really like them. They don't lower their offers for them because Oxbridge don't lower their offers for every for anything uh, but uh, doing an EPQ can definitely tip you in the right direction. Um, if you're applying for two different courses can you send two different personal statements? No. Uh, I will. Uh, I should have said that actually as part of this. Uh, the it, you you have one UCAS application that goes to all five. So that personal statement has to be suitable for all the courses you're applying for. That means that the courses should be in the same course family. So you can apply for a sociology degree and a criminology degree, for example, but you can't apply for sociology and physics because you cannot make that personal statement work for those uh, for those two courses. Unis do appreciate, though, that students do apply for like slightly different courses. So if it is you know, if it's not exactly bang on for what they're applying for, that's fine. And 
we we ask students to not mention the name of the university or the or the exact name of the course in their personal statement because it has to go to so many. What are deadlines for art foundation courses? They are all no, so art foundation courses have all different deadlines. Each different university or college has its own separate deadline. You don't apply for art for art foundation through UCAS. It's done directly to the uni or the college. They are usually in February or March. The best people to ask are the art teachers because they will have a really good oversight of exactly when those deadlines are. And art teachers will you should students should always let their art teachers know if they're applying for art foundation anyway because they will help them with their portfolio submission uh if you have so if your child is um applying wanting to apply for oxbridge and hasn't told anyone at their school yet i would advise you tell their form tutor uh so they so their form tutor knows and can help them with any with preparation or guide them to the right people they need to help them with preparation. It will also mean their form tutor knows that their application has to be done first, so their reference has to be done first, so that is why we, we need to know early. Uh, do you apply for UCAS this year for to start September 2025 if you are applying for Art Foundation? No, so you don't apply, as I just said, you don't apply for Art Foundation through UCAS, you apply directly and you generally don't defer with Art Foundation. You would normally apply in the year that you're going. Something to be aware of with Art Foundation, it's only free if you are uh, under 19. So if your child is going to be 19, when they start Art Foundation, they have to pay for it. And it's about four and a half thousand pounds. So if they are planning to defer Art Foundation, then I would maybe think twice about that because it could end up costing quite a lot of money. You also can't get a student loan to cover those fees you can get another loan you can get a, a, another kind of loan from the government to cover them uh but it doesn't come from stu from student finance england um if you want to email me about that i can talk to you about it a little bit more because it's a little bit complicated uh, but i'm more than happy to answer that question uh, directly some people giving really good some me some good examples of charities and people that help with med schools and people that help with applications here which is really helpful a um, couple more questions about EPQ. Is it too late to start? Uh, William Ellis run a one year EPQ. Uh, so if they have space, then they should be able to join the William Ellis cohort in year 13 to do an EPQ. Uh, that is something, again, to if, if you're based at WES, then they should ask their form tutor, uh, ask your head of year at WES. If you're based elsewhere, then again, ask the form tutor to get in touch with WES to see if they can do a one year EPQ. I think the other schools, I think we all run a, an 18 month or two year EPQ, but WES definitely do a one year one. So as I say, if the as long as the course isn't full, uh, they should be able to join. Uh, will the school give any information about preparing portfolios for art and design? Yes, they should. And it will be the art teachers that will do that because they are the specialists. Uh, form tutors uh, won't be the person to go to about portfolios because they just won't have the experience in that area. Uh, but art teachers will be able to, to help with those things. Again, uh, you know, students should let their art teachers know that they're applying for an art degree, uh, because otherwise they might not. Uh, subject teachers don't have access to UCAS in the same way that tutors do. So subject teachers aren't monitoring UCAS applications. Tutors are. So if a student needs subject teacher help, they need to tell them that they are applying for, uh, for UCAS uh, in that particular subject. Um, how long does it take to a teacher to review all the UCAS forms and should the people prompt them at all? Um, it, so it depends on when they hand it in. Um, so if a student gets their UCAS form in quite early, the tutor probably won't have many others to look at and they'll be able to review it quite quickly. If they hand their UCAS form in in January, their tutor could have 25 UCAS applications to look at. So it's going to take time. So this is one of the reasons why we do encourage them to get them in before Christmas. So again, the tutors have a little bit more time to look over them. Um, they can take a while to go through, especially personal statements. So we would really say to students as well, please don't submit your UCAS application on the 30th of January and expect a tutor to fully review it and go through it and give them feedback because that just won't happen if it's got to go off the next day. It will just be sent. Uh, so, you know, 
get the ask tutors as early as possible uh, to review things, get personal statements to them as quickly as possible, tell tutors when they've you know, when they've they finished their UCAS you know, uh, so they can get in and have a look as you know, as quickly as they can. Um, but if you know if it's sitting there for you know a week and no one's looked at it, then yeah, by all means, just give them a little nudge uh, and ask them uh, when they are when they'll be able to get round to to seeing it. Okay, I think final question then is about mock interviews. Will they have mock interviews? Yes, as I've said, if a student has an interview, then we will arrange a mock interview, at least one mock interview for them with uh, either a member of staff at the swap. We also work with uh, the orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment who do lot, who do UCAS prep and mock interviews for us. We work with Camden School for Girls who do um, mock interviews and things for us. We work with Highgate School. We work with Channing School. Uh, so we have access to lots of uh, sort of subject specialists who can do mock interviews. We don't do mock interviews unless a student has applied, obviously applied for a course where they're likely to have an interview. So really it's often restricted to, usually restricted to Oxford, Cambridge and the medicine adjacent uh, degrees. Uh, okay, so I am just going to wrap up. Uh, sorry, one more question. When should students start working on personal statements for early entry? Now. Now, if they are doing early entry, then their personal statements need to be submitted to tutors as soon as they get back at the start of year 13. Because as I said, they've only got five weeks to uh, to get this turned around, to get the whole application done. So if they are early entry, if they are October deadline students, those personal statements must be done over summer. For other students who are January deadline students, they can start planning them over summer, and but they can, and they, but then they can start writing them once we get back in year 13. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope that was really comprehensive. I hope I've been through everything you needed. As I say, there is my email. I'm just going to get that uh, other slide up to that with, there we go. There's the uh, sign up there for the UK, the UCAS parents sign up where you'll get uh, information about deadlines and uh, other bits and bobs through from UCAS. Uh, really, really good to sign up to. If you've got any questions, as I say, that are uh, specific, specific about your child or about a particular course or about something that needs a bit more um, you know, discussion and talking over, please do email me. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Uh, I'm not in school tomorrow. I'm on the University of Hertfordshire trip uh, and I don't work on Fridays. So if you do email me this week, I won't be able to get back to you next week, until next week, but I promise that I will. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a really nice evening. Goodbye. Hi, if you've raised your hand, if you'd like to speak. Okay, no worries. Thank you again, everyone.